Let's jump to what are your thoughts about like going out to eat versus like just learning to cook. There's a difference between, and you can touch on this, like learning to cook something fancy to impress a date or just I need to feed my family. Exactly. Learning to cook for a fancy date. Some people are impressed by pancakes. Some people are impressed by steak. Learn the techniques and then implement it for that specific part. If you learn the technique, if you need to go out and buy a cast iron pan for a steak, go to a thrift shop, scrub the sucker down with soap. <laughs> People will tell you not to put soap on a cast iron pan all the time. Scrub it down with soap, season it properly, just look up how to do it. The internet is innovative now. Welcome back to the Sign of Good Health podcast. So I'm, I'm here with Kevin Harder. He is a professional chef. So we're going to talk about his experience with that. So Kevin, you want to start off telling me about kind of your cooking background? Like when did you start? Uh, I started when I was 12. I started with a and w drive-in uh, up north in northern Minnesota, Aurora, Minnesota, actually. Um, it was high stress, high strung. I did not know what I was doing. And it just kind of stepped through and uh, opened up a lot of doors and then figured out that I was good at it and uh, continued with some uh, daycare stuff. I cooked for some kids oh, sure. uh, through high school and then not so much. I, I did some dishwashing, which everybody does. And then I graduated and went to culinary school. So what was the line of thought with like wanting to keep going and go to culinary school? Um, everyone in my family was good at it. Uh, I, I grew up with just barbecues all the time with family events because it was easy. Um, and with that, you know, it was all of my uncles on my, on my dad's side. And uh, with that, it just, continued to roll in my brain like, you know, I, I am good at cooking, so why not make it, and I didn't think that it was going to be like a, a definitive career, because I had other ideas, you know, I was like, oh, I could try out for the Olympics, I could try out to be a professional athlete, I was a really good swimmer when I was in high school, but um, that didn't take off because I went from high school to culinary school. They don't necessarily have a scholarship program for swimming and culinary at the same time. Well, you can grab your fish on your way down. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, um, with, with that being said, it was just, you know, okay, what other kind of competitive things can I get into? And I'm a very competitive person as well. Uh, I, I did some uh, competitive cooking, competitive baking. I don't like baking. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so it just, it kind of spiraled into that. And then through that, I kind of lost myself in cooking. I started to get a little stressed out. So uh, I completely switched career paths into training. So that's where... Fitness training. Fitness training, yeah, personal training. Um, and then... From there, it just kind of went back and forth. Um, one, because of the stable part of cooking, and then the general public aspect of helping people with training. Just kind of the umbrella concept. Yeah. yeah, so you can have one, you can't have the other, you can't stand in the middle. You can try to stand in the middle, but you're gonna stand on one side no matter what. So, uh, and then physical therapy. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, and I've definitely had the kind of dual career path thing too with the, the video stuff and the journalism and then the f more fitness side mm -hmm. and now we have the podcast is kind of a merging. Yeah. So. And it seems like a, a pretty good middle. You don't have to make that a career, but you can make it right. as a hobby. So let's go through, um, tell me about your experience working in different kind of cooking settings mm -hmm. and then, uh, then we can go through the kind of pros and cons of each. Yeah. So, um, 
the start off of, you know, burger flipping. Yeah, I, I worked at an A&W, and it was strictly burger flipping, burger flipping. Pros, you get a free meal. <laughs> you get one free meal a shift. Cons, it's hot. It sucks. It really sucks. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then, you know, just experience. Experience is probably pro and then also a con because it's like you have just this natural, uh, you get shit on a lot. I mean, just terribly. They'll tell you like... Is that like in the restaurant or just people knowing you're a burger flipper? Or no, not flipper? even knowing that you're a burger flipper. People, like, the, the, culinary, the, the culinary field uh, will respect that you're a burger flipper. It doesn't matter. That's the kind of... Is it, is it more of a like paying your dues role, like dishwashing? Yeah, yeah, you know, because I, I did dishwashing, and, you know, if you don't start off as a dishwasher or you start off as, like, the bottom-end burger flipper making, like, just slinging patties or something, then that's just what it is. You know, at, at the end of the day, I was still a dishwasher. I was still a burger flipper. I was still this because um, it it's a starting point. And then culinary went field. The culinary school went by, and I did uh, stages, or you go in, you work for free, um, and th there are nightmare stories about that. You go in, you work for free, you do one specific thing, and it means absolutely nothing because the head. She can come, she can be here. Yeah, yeah that's fine. Monday. <laughs> we have a new uh, dog on the podcast. Sorry, Bailey. <laughs> uh, yes. Hey, knock it off. Knock. knock it off. Lay down. It's fine. Yeah. Lay down. Here. Yeah, you're fine. Uh, so, uh, for instance, like I, I had to do a seven-sided football-shaped cut. Uh, I had to do five gallons of potatoes. So it's it's called a tourne, uh, and it's because you stop it. You uh, take and you know spin around everything. It French for tornado for some reason. Mm -hmm. Don't know why. Yeah. <laughs> but um, and I did five gallons of potatoes, and my chef at the time that I was doing the stage for dumped it in a vat of boiling water. And then I saw him take an immersion blender and make potato leek soup. And it's like, okay, I, I guess. Yeah. Now I know how to do that skill, and I will never forget it. But at the same time, you didn't have to do that. Yeah. So, and that's, it was, it was par for the course for just culinary school. Mm -hmm. um, it just, everybody had to do it at one point, or you did other things. And from there, I went to a country club up in Bemidji, Bemidji Town and Country Club. Great food. They're still using uh, recipes of mine, of everybody that I wanted to include in it. And uh, I did my internship there. So I worked a minimal of 25 hours a week. I was working way more than that. Got it documented, got it signed off on the head chef that was there. And then um, had my hazing as well there, just like five gallons of potato tournays. Um, and that was, hazing for that was uh, go and find the food clue, go and find this, go and find that, because the stuff doesn't exist. Yeah. Go down the street and ask the other restaurant that is friends with us and, and, and do this. And I did because I was young, dumb, and kind of an idiot and didn't know what I was doing. I, I knew enough about the culinary field, but I didn't know everything. Yeah. And it's just kind of, again, it's par for the course as being from a country club standpoint because it was a golf course. I finished my externship, internship, however you want to call it, and I got the head chef job directly after that for the next season. So it was a seasonal, a seasonal position, and they, um, the head chef just left. 
no question, no comment, no nothing about it. Didn't know he was leaving. <laughs> Got a call about two days after. Hey, we have a job to offer you. Seasonal, but head chef position. It's like, I, I mean, I can order food, I guess, to an extent. So I just kind of kept with what that head chef was doing at the time and modified it accordingly because you have sales. You know, if something doesn't sell, put something else on the menu right. that does, that will pique people's interest instead of a salad, a burger, a steak. Yeah. Um, and that just kind of eventually came to like everything was at a settle and then the season ended. You are close. <laughs> God. <laughs> um, sorry. <laughs> talking about burgers and yeah. steak. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I, the season ended, so I was like, I have to find a different job. So I, I went to this... You can't say fine dining, because the menu was atrocious. The Before I got there, it was really bad. Yeah. Because they're just like, we want fine dining. Well, it's Bemidji, Minnesota. <laughs> like, what kind of... You got Green Mill across the road. <laughs> yeah. Like, you can't get any... You're not going to get clientele, because unless you have regulars. We want classic French cuisine. Well, it's a good thing I went to a French culinary <laughs> school, because holy crap, this is bad. Yeah. Uh, so I, I put walleye on the menu because it's a white fish. It goes really well with everything. can't get it in France, but you can get other white fish in France that taste relatively the same. And then, um, you know, I, I, I put mussels on the menu. I did this, I did that. I got a few horror stories about that place. Yeah. Uh, you know, there, there are... You know, so I guess I'll jump back. Pros and cons of, of the, the country club side of it. You're run by a board of directors. These high-end people that like to go out and golf. And by high-end people, I mean... Like, are we thinking like Fraser Crane types? Uh, doctors. Doctors. Doctors, okay. surgeons. Yeah. Uh, and, um, and that's kind of like your, your high-end clientele in Bemidji is... That's it. You don't have businessmen. You don't have this. You don't have that because it's such a small town. Granted, I came from a town of twelve hundred people, and the rich part of town is doctors and lawyers and this and that. And that's that's all the country club was. It wasn't. It wasn't segregated by income though. Like anybody could go and eat there. Anyone could go out and play golf. It was just super expensive to go play golf. Food was cheap. You had to make sure it was cheap because people are paying. Was it like 250 bucks to play eight rounds of golf? That's dumb. So I got free golf though, and I'm not good at it. Yeah. Uh, but and then and then I went to Sparkling Waters. Sparkling Waters in Bemidji. Don't recommend eating there because <laughs> ownership. But um, yeah, sorry. Back to the pros and cons of it. You're run by a board of directors. Um, anything they say go, their your income to order food is dictated by how much they want to give you. So like, you have to sit in front of a board of directors and sit there and go like, I need $10,000 more this year because food costs went up. Mm -hmm. Well, we don't understand why. Because beef went up, because vegetables went up, because we're in a drought, because we're in this, because we're in that. They don't understand that because they're making more money than they know what to do with. And then you're stuck in this bubble of, I guess I'll do, but then we're going to go negative because they won't give us more money. Pros are, I got to hire whoever I wanted. I got to get rid of whoever I wanted because I went from straight out of culinary school to being everyone's boss. Yeah. I didn't get rid of anybody because there was no point. 
I knew that they knew the menu, and they knew way more about that place than I did because I was only working there for nine months. Right. So, from that, I mean, I I I got the family aspect of the culinary field from that, and that just kind of passed through everything. Um, and that's also more on the pro side of it. It's like you have this group of people that are willing to sit there behind you, have your back, push you forward and go, no, we need more money so that we can do what we need to do. Yeah, so it's a very, very good, strong team dynamic. Yeah, and there was one guy, um, well, there's two, two specific guys, three, wow, <laughs> three guys, they, they had been working there for 20 plus years under the same guy, and they're just like, oh, we don't know if we're going to like this guy, like this, this new kid, he's straight out of culinary school. Any one of them could have taken my job. Any one of them could have applied for it. Any one of them could have just gotten put on nomination for it. <laughs> it was at that point, like, I knew that, because when I went in, I was just like, I want everybody there. And they showed up because they had resignation letters in their hand. Like, we could have your job. Screw you. We don't want your job, screw you, and just it. It the culinary school, the culinary field has this really sour side, and then the really kind side. When I walked up in front of everybody, I went, "I'm going to keep everything the same and slowly integrate things that are not uh, sell, uh, slowly integrate things into things that are not selling." Mm -hmm. And they went. And they crumpled up. Yeah, I was just going to ask about, like, how do you go about uh, building that bridge of trust? Or... Yeah, so, and, and my, my thing was, it's like, people are buying certain things on the menu. Mm -hmm. The things that they're not buying, I'm going to get rid of. And I'm going to put something else on there. Because if it's not selling, <laughs> yeah, there's no point in having it. We can do other things with that product. We can still order the same exact things, but put a different product on the menu. Or just reword it, which I did <laughs> a couple of different times. We'll, we'll get, we, we are going to talk about like menu yeah. design and stuff. And so. then, uh, so <laughs> then, uh, skipping forward again now uh, to Sparkling Waters. Um, they wanted this fine dining experience, so oh, French cuisine, this and that. Atmosphere didn't call for it. And it was right off the lake in Lake Bemidji. But their atmosphere, I was like, you guys have to completely change the atmosphere. You have like porcelain dolls in the menu, uh, on, on like in the, the window. Like this, this isn't French. Yeah. Why? And they're just like, oh no, because my parents are playing for paying for the place. It's like, oh, go figure. And I had free reign mm -hmm. over that place, which was great, and I I marked that on the pros. But and then as soon as I did something that the one. Two owners, husband and wife. Perfect. Yeah, that's 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 what you want <laughs> owning a restaurant. Yeah. Uh, and I don't even classify this place as uh, fine dining, but they wanted fine dining, so I gave them a menu of fine dining. Mm -hmm. Prime rib wrapped asparagus and uh, lemon and caper fries, pan fried walleye pork chop, prime rib on Friday nights, um, and so on and so forth, of super fancy things that can make a lot of money if you do it right. But the wife, who was on my side, the husband, who was completely against me, um, because, oh, you're spending way too much money. And then his wife would turn around and go like, just keep doing what you're doing, it's yeah, fine, so we trust know. you. And he's just like, no, we need to save money. It's just like, if you, you charge $30 for all you can eat prime rib, and you're making money. You're making a lot of money. But they didn't seem to, he didn't seem to understand that, whereas she trusted the... An experienced math guy. Yeah. So, well, not even math. Well, experience just, with the math. Like yeah, that. yeah. I mean, it, yeah. it's just, you know... You don't have to cut that much off the prime rib. Or if someone wants an extra thick piece, you go, don't worry, I gave you the thickest one. You really, you cut it the same. Yeah. You just gave it more fat. Like, yeah. 
it so it never never really occurred to him that he could be making a lot more money. Uh, so you have that dynamic of two people owning the same restaurant. A huge con. You do not want to go into business with a partner. You can work with your partner. That's fine. I worked with my wife several times in several kitchens. But I would never own a restaurant or own a food truck with her because screw that. Yeah. That she would trust me and I know that we would make money. But no. I, I one, I don't want to do it. It's too much overhead to try and open a restaurant or a food truck. Well, I can ask you this too. So yeah. like I know uh, lawyers will tell people not to go to law school. Would you say what would you say about culinary school? Don't do it. You can learn so much more by some person that doesn't speak English. They can they can speak three different languages, none of them being English. You can learn more by watching them. Because that's all it is. It's just about experience. Mm. You screw up, you burn yourself. I don't have feeling in my fingertips anymore because I burnt myself so many times. <laughs> yeah. um, you screw up, you cut your fingertip off. I don't have a whole lot of mine left. Um, trial by error. That, that's what it is. You know, If you don't do something right, repeat it until you get it right. Make those mental notes. Have someone critique you because and for some people, if you want to make your career into the culinary field as famous as Rachel Ray, Bobby Flay, sure, go to culinary school. Bobby Flay went to culinary school. Rachel Ray, I don't think she did. I can't remember. That, that would be something I'd actually have to look up, but I, I'm not entirely sure. But um, these these high-end people, you'll chances are you're not getting to that level. Opening your own restaurant, you have to have a specific niche in the culinary field to do it. You want to smoke meat? Do it. There are tons of food trucks out there that are smoking their own meat, and I know of a lot of them, and they're all good. You want to make tacos? Do it. You want to make crepes? You want to do this? You want to make soup? Just do it. Like, you look up recipes online, critique them so you're not stealing, which I've heard of law problems of stealing a celebrity's uh, recipe, not critiquing it to yourself, to your specific uh, what you want to do uh, you'll get sued for some reason I don't know why if they catch you if you can and chances are you'll lay roll, like low enough on the radar yeah, you're not you're, gonna you're, you're, you're not gonna, gonna, move, gonna get the attention of yeah, someone that you don't day. move the needle so no it, and that's the thing it's like but if you start to do that change it <laughs> because yeah. they will find out I don't know how um, but no, it's, if you plan on opening your own restaurant, go to a school that has an accounting degree, get that accounting degree. If you have, and, and they have to have uh, people in the environment because you have to know how to do those things. Uh, you have to know how to recycle properly. You have to know how to recycle oil properly from fryers. You have to read, you know, your trash can't exceed this amount versus your recycle because when you recycle it's a tax write off and a whole bunch of accounting stuff but um, and no you don't need to go to culinary school you really don't just step into it with an open mind and open to critique and you can learn anything go to one place learn everything you can not like learn when you go up to the person and go Hey, listen, I understand that I'm a very valuable person here, but I think I need to move forward. They will respect that because that you feel you've learned as much as you can from that specific person. But, uh, no, you don't. 
you don't need to call the culinary school. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, no, it, it's, it's definitely worth it. I don't regret it. Yeah. Um, but just to learn, and we'll get into how to learn cooking later. Yeah. yeah so, and then from there, I went and I did uh, Crown Plaza in Minneapolis. I did Lat 14 uh, in Golden Valley. Really good food. Not so great management. Um, not to badmouth anything, but just it, it it just it is what it is. I mean, it it's managed by the owner. She doesn't offer health care. Whereas, like the Crown Plaza at the time, um, Union was great, and I actually got to work underneath the guy that opened the Court on Blue in Mendota Heights. I didn't know that he opened it until I got the job. And he's like, yeah, I opened your school. I was just, and that was my interview. He goes, oh, you went to school? Like, did you get the degree or did you get the certification? I was like, well, the certification got cut. I don't know, the degree got cut, so I got the certification. That's fine. You know enough. Yeah. So, so but yeah. So you bring up healthcare. So how did the pandemic affect you and then just those in the industry? So, yeah, um... Uh, I was working at the Crown Plaza in Minneapolis, the, the hotel at the time when the pandemic hit. It was kind of surreal because I didn't think anything like that would ever happen to the culinary field. You don't think like a whole industry would shut down. And it did. And the, the hotel itself was kind of struggling at the time, but they were making it work. Um, and then the pandemic hit specifically and they just kind of took all of the kitchen staff and went, see ya. We're gonna close the kitchen, we're gonna renovate it, we're gonna make it into rooms. Wow. So that's what they did. And it wasn't easy. I, I stepped away from a job that was secure and I thought I was going to actually give me up to go back to college with it but that didn't happen and it was fine um, I get phone calls from the head chef that was there he even got fired um, which is saying something because the knowledge that that man has is just absolutely insane I mean and that's something that like I was for sure, like, there's no way he can get canned from this, and he did. So, um, I have friends that lost their jobs, I have coworkers that lost their jobs, and uh, some people are springing back really, really well. Uh, a friend of mine is working at a pretty good place in Minneapolis, I don't remember the name of it off the top of my head, but it's, it's a higher end place. He's making way more money, and he was the sous chef at the at the hotel, so. And sous chef is number two guy? Essentially, yeah. There were two of them, one in the morning, one at night. He sure. was primarily the night guy. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it, and, you know, it, it, it's all dependent. Like, I didn't have a sous chef when I was working at the country club. Mm -hmm. I didn't have a sous chef when I was working at Sparkling Waters, mainly because the overhead wasn't high enough. So I couldn't pay another person's salary. Yeah. So, I, could have gotten away with paying my workers' salary, but then they were all working, all working overtime, and they're just like, nah, we like our hourly, so. Yeah. <laughs> but. Um, so let's go into a um, little bit of the stereotypes with like how clean are places, and that could be like pre-pandemic and then now. Yeah, um, well, I mean, there, there are a lot more stereotypes just than cleanliness yeah. even then. Well, well yeah the next one is about the, the waiters. Yeah the so all right well then we'll we'll <laughs> we'll go into uh, cleanliness. Uh, no it is not waiting. The movie waiting is not accurate. We don't that absolutely not. You have to go through the specific uh, exam and class so you learn about foodborne illnesses and what can make someone sick um, because you know, you can grab a doorknob and make anybody sick. 
Uh, serve safe is the course that you have to take. It's like a three hour course. It's one test. If you don't get above 85%, you don't pass. I mean, it's as simple as that. You know, if you can't get 85% of foodborne illnesses done, <laughs> you shouldn't be cooking, or right. you shouldn't have that, that certification. Yeah. That being said, you don't have to have that. Only a certain number of people per staff have to have that. I worked in a couple places where it's like everyone had to have it, and then I worked in one place where it's just like as long as there's one person in the kitchen that has it, it's fine. So someone's always watching out for how cleanliness, uh, how clean everything is. Uh, so I can't say that it's dirty. I can't say that it's clean uh, pre-pandemic. Uh, Post-pandemic, I don't necessarily know. I imagine that things are a lot more careful. Yeah, like more, um, more people probably stepped up their game. Yeah, definitely. If you don't get that A in your inspection, you're not going to get it. But that's dependent on what kind of inspections you're getting. Because we had serve safe inspections at the hotel, and then and that was once a year. And then we had one every month. And that was EcoSure. EcoSure is a pain just because, oh, when's the last time you changed out your sanitizer bucket? Was it two hours and one minute ago? Go change it out. Really? Okay, I guess. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, by any means, I'm not going to put raw chicken on the same thing that I put cooked chicken on because yeah. salmonella. Right. But it, it's just like if you have common sense about cooking, people won't get sick. Get in the kitchen, wash your hands properly. Yeah. Don't put raw food where cooked food goes. Don't put cooked food where raw food goes, and you're good to go. The prep food stays in the back, the, the cooked food stays in the front, or like the, the ready to eat meal, and you know. So it's, I imagine, like, I, I, I go to a fast food restaurant now and I see everyone wearing gloves where it's like, that never happened beforehand. I had people handing me raw food, like their food, my food with a ungloved hand. Yeah. So it's, it's definitely stepped up. I don't know to what degree, yeah. and I don't know exactly if it is safer or not. Yeah, I imagine it's probably the same. Sure. Yeah. I, knowing how people operate. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so let's go into the the fun, <laughs> don't piss off the waiter type things that yeah. you see in movies and. So like, again, waiting. Um, yeah. If uh, I've worked in a few places where it's just like, you know. You, um, for instance, I was working at an Applebee's at one point, and the guy asked for a steak blue. Well, it's like barely cooked. And so the waitress comes back and tells me, he's like, this guy wants the steak blue, like as rare as you can get it. It's like, I'm just sticking the thing in a pan then. Searing up all sides. It's going to be cold in the middle. Yeah. He's okay with that, right? She goes, that's what he wants. Okay, and he sent it back because it was inedible. What? Duh. You're at Applebee's and you're ordering a steak. Blue. You're not going to this five-star restaurant getting this nice marbled steak. Mm -hmm. This is prepackaged. This is in a <laughs> vacuum pack thing with like a brine on it. Mm -hmm. You can almost eat these things raw. You shouldn't. But you can. Yeah. Uh, so I was like, okay, I guess I'll cook it a little bit longer. So I actually put it on the on the grill, and there were now grill marks on it. So okay, I send it back. At that point, it's rare, still inedible. So the waitress goes up to the manager, and goes, I can't deal with this guy. He wanted it blue. He's already sent it back once. He's sending it back again. Says, okay, I'll uh, I'll take care of it. I'm not mad yet, <laughs> yet, but he sends it back until it's about mid-well. So I, I cook it rare, medium rare, 
medium, medium well. And then he finally sits and goes, this is what I wanted. Why didn't you know that? And I'm like, you asshole. I could have just burnt the son of a bitch <laughs> and it would have been fine. But no, I, 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 you, you shouldn't piss off the people that uh, serve your food, that, you know, cook your food, because they're going to be crabby, and you're going to know that they're crabby because of how many times you sent it back and how they present your food again and again and again and again. That being said, everyone in the culinary field is always a crab ass. Uh, and I will wholeheartedly tell you that we are all just perpetually mad because what are we doing? We're sitting in front of a hot grill all day long, and we're it's loud. And yep, and we have the fans running. It's loud. The only thing that we have to ourselves is the music playing around that we put on. That sounds angry, by the way, because <laughs> it's. I mean, yeah, it's Red Hot Chili Peppers or anything like that, but or it's just straight death metal um, or you go into a Mexican restaurant and it's mariachi, mariachi or it's uh, I had one guy that worked with me and it was always like ballads love ballads in Spanish and belting to the top of his lungs and it's just like okay cool I don't care and good singer <laughs> so I, I couldn't complain yeah but um, as far as everything goes like yeah it's, it's really not you know you Granted, you shouldn't really ever make anybody mad. You shouldn't have it out against the waitress, out against this. They're stressed. They're under stress. They're in a high pace, you know, environment all the time. Eight hours a day, ten hours a day, twelve hours a day, sometimes fifteen hours a day. And it's not something that anyone has ever been put up on. Because it's hot, they're moving, they're doing this, they're doing that. They got a hundred and one different things going on in their head. I'm sorry if they forgot your water. <laughs> like, yeah. Just politely remind them, and it's fine. Mm -hmm. It's like, hey, I'm sorry. Like, I did. They don't even like sit there and say sorry. I asked for a water. Just go, hey, can I get another water? Like, oh yeah, that's fine. Or like, and they'll realize like. Oh, I forgot. Okay, I'll get more on top of it. These people are high functioning, very high functioning people who probably have anxiety or something. <laughs> so that that's not that's they don't intentionally forget your 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 food, your water, your your sustenance. Yeah. So. So um, let's go into a, a little bit about um, well, there's. Broadly, the concept. Are you familiar with the ship of Theseus? Not quite. Right, so it's it's uh, after Theseus and the Golden Fleece and whatever. So uh, it's the thing that says like if you replace enough parts on the ship, is it still the same ship? Okay. So translating that to food, it's like, what are your thoughts about like you need X ingredients and seasonings and whatever to make the food how it should be versus people that say they don't like X, Y, and Z. Oh, okay, so that <laughs> we'll take we'll take Mexican food or Spanish food or Spaniard food and cilantro. Most people, or a good percentage of the people in the world, look at cilantro and they can't stand it because it tastes like soap. Is it Mexican food or is it Spanish food or Spaniard food? If it doesn't have cilantro, Indian food has cilantro. It's just a different kind. And and that being said, like. Yeah, it is. It just doesn't taste right to me. Um, if you're making Indian food and it doesn't have turmeric in it, <laughs> it's probably not Indian food. <laughs> um, so as far as that goes, I mean, it, I guess it goes to fusion or authentic because you have these fusion places now that you know, they go like, oh, we're going to do fusion. Like, what does fusion mean? Fusion is like you take one culture or one, like, ethnic food group and then you fuse it with, like, some not commonly done, but we'll go with two completely different things. Like, 
Malaysian food and Irish. <laughs> sure. So like, okay, now we're gonna take all the stuff that we would brine in Malaysian food and we're gonna put Guinness on it. <laughs> that would not taste good. I yeah, don't recommend it's just doing an example, it. Yeah. yeah, but it that that would definitely uh, you know what is it then? Uh, I would say it's crap. But um, something that's really common is like people will take authentic like Hawaiian food and then they'll take and go, oh, we're gonna put Mexican food in it with it because. You know, an island here and kind of like a peninsula there, not really peninsula, but yeah, an area yeah. there. But then you, you can put coconut in with a whole bunch of Mexican food. Or like you'll take Japanese food and then you'll put Hawaiian things in with it because it, it's dependent on where it is on the map, really. Mm-hmm. You know, the U.S. has burgers and uh, hot dogs and this and that. What do we really have that's our own? Nothing. Um, so, in a way, like, replacing some things is fine, and it can still be the same dish, but when you replace so much of it, no, it, it's not the same. It'll taste completely different, and it, it'll, Asian food, for instance, you go to uh, India, or you go to South Korea two completely different flavor profiles. Mm-hmm. South Korea to Vietnam, completely different. Vietnam to China, completely different. China to Japan, completely different. Because of the different flavor profiles and what they have as a crop sure. or as a spice. Makes sense. Um, China had this big, what was it? It was the... Well, they had the whole Silk Road thing. Yeah, the Silk Road, yeah. and then there was another one that was, it was a... Uh, it was this. Um, it was a spice trail or something yeah. along the lines of it, and because of that trail, that dictates what those people eat today. <laughs> yeah, because you know you learn about it in history class, but yeah. it's like this is how it actually translates into. Yeah. Stuff. So that and that's why people eat what they're eating today. Yeah. They're switching it up because innovation. Yeah, it's globalization. Kind yeah, of stuff. but you know we. Italy didn't have pizza dough. Why they got pizza dough? <laughs> no clue, but they got it. Sure. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I mean, like it took it around. <laughs> they, yeah, they did, and you know that, that that's fine. But it, it it didn't originally come from Italy. A lot of Italians will make me be very very mad at me. I'm not Italian. I don't care. Right. Uh, and that's just kind of the culinary part. You know, culinary side of me. It's just like if I make anybody mad I don't care it, it is what it is yeah move on to the next person that's fine yeah so so, um, so should somebody like this is kind of like are people too picky like should you try something new or order something you expect you'll like I it depends on how adventurous you really are um, I went through culinary school and I, I wasn't allergic to anything there were some stuff outside. I got done with culinary school. I went to an Easter dinner and I felt my throat kind of getting scratchy because we had a shellfish dinner. And now I'm anaphylactic shock allergic to shellfish. So, um, but adventure is adventure. You know, um, I went into culinary school with an open mind. I tried everything. I do not like, um, Oysters. They feel like snot yeah. to me. But some people like them. I mean, sure. Um, as far as everything else goes, though, I mean, I I try things that I have never had. Um, chances are, if you go to a restaurant that is a type of food that you've never had, you're not going to find anything that you've ever had. Chicken is always a safe bet. Mm-hmm. Try the chicken. Try the spices on the chicken. Indian food is a very good example of that. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, go for it is, is my explanation to people because Greek food. I didn't know a whole lot of Greek places when I was growing up. And I thought, like, lamb would be weird. 
damn, it's delicious. <laughs> but, um, and, and now Greek food, or, yeah, Greek food is honestly one of my favorite. I don't cook it a lot, I cook more Asian food, but uh, I also studied Asian food in culinary school. So I tried all the Asian food, and I love all of it. If I could go back and still eat shrimp and crab and all these other things, oh, I have very expensive dinners at home. <laughs> so uh, I, I recommend people just, just kind of go for it. And if you feel like, eh, you know what, maybe I won't like it, maybe you will, because it's, it's kind of a shotgun effect. Like, there are things you're going to get somewhere over here that you're going to like, mm -hmm. and then there are things on the other side that you're going to hate. And it's fine. Like, but... But now you know. Now you know, and it... Some people don't like the taste of cilantro, which is just weird to me. Like, just do it. Just eat it. I don't care. Like... Yeah. Well, and uh, like, one thing I get frustrated with is just people... There's a level of, like, you need to eat like an adult. Like, just... Yeah deal with it if it's not a hundred percent to your preference. Oh, but if, if you absolutely hate it, chances are the restaurant is going to come by and go, hey, how's everything going? And you just look at them politely and go, this isn't what I was expecting. Can I get something else? Chances are they'll be fine with it. Applebee's won't be because Applebee's is Applebee's fine dining places. Yeah. Hey, is everything okay? I'm sorry, this isn't exactly what I thought it was going to be. I don't care for it. It's it, it, it's something that you can't stomach. Yeah. So, But politely, like, I, I don't care for it. Can I get something else? Oh, by any means, yes. What do you want? And they'll put it in for you, and you'll get it. it it's not it's not the end of the world if you don't if you really don't like it. If you're just like, nah, it's like, okay, I guess I can eat it, buckle up and eat it, man, because yeah. that's an inconvenience yeah. to the person where it's like, no, I physically can't stomach this. All right, let's find something you do like. Mm. Chances are they'll find you something you like. Yeah. So um, this is kind of a side thing, um, but I mean, cause you're you know, a fitness guy too. So, <laughs> so for myself, I... As a general thing, I get frustrated with the small portions at restaurants. Mm -hmm. I don't get full. Why are they so small? <laughs> They're... Uh, we'll, we'll take, for instance, Old Country Buffet. Uh, it's an all-you-can-eat buffet. You go in, tons of different food. Mm -hmm. They took their... 10 inch plates. You know, you think of a 10 inch plate, you don't think of anything that big. And they switched it to a 9 inch plate. And they saved money. They saved a lot of money switching to 1 inch smaller. Why? Because people can't. I mean, you have the people that sit there and like mound their food and just like eat from the top to the bottom and everything just kind of like seeps into each other. Disgusting. <laughs> First off, yeah. separate your food and then like combine it the way you want. Don't just shovel it in yeah. like a bear. <laughs> uh, so like they, 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 they decreased the diameter of their plate by an inch. And they saved like $30,000 per restaurant in food because they didn't have to cook as much. Like a year or a month? Or... It, within like the first year. Okay. Which is insane. Your overhead there is just like, let's just keep ordering cheap crap. And uh, so, it, as far as that goes, they just did one thing to increase their profit. Because they were already making profit. Fine dining places. You can find a lot of fine dining places that serve you way too much food and then you can find a lot of fine dining places that are just like here's your portion <laughs> and then you don't get full um and i guess it's just kind of the dynamic of the restaurant um because if you're going there 
for food or if you're going there for an experience. Hibachi, which is a performance and a meal at the same time. The guy sits in front of you in front of a flat top grill and he cooks a bunch of different food. That's fine. Like, they're very, very good at what you do. For three people, you're going to spend 150 bucks. But it's a dinner and a show and Asian food isn't that expensive to make, so you do get generally pretty full. Um, the other side of it, uh, fancy French cooking, no, you're not going to get full. You're getting a five course meal and you're not going to be full at the end of it. Five bites. <laughs> five bites out of something. Uh, and that's, that's a place that you're paying a lot of money for the experience of a five course meal. You go in, you do not get a menu. You get exactly what the cook wants to give you. You get a choice of meat or no meat, or meat, seafood, or no meat. Dietary preferences is basically what it is. Yeah. And, and they give you their portion of this super nice black tie att attire food. And that is more on the creative side mm -hmm. and more uh, more along the line of passion than... Yeah, like it's more food as art more yeah. than food as food. Yeah, and and I know you told me that we'll kind of dive into that yeah. as well. well so. we, we can go to like, like let's talk about like the, the dining, the importance of the dining experience as yeah. the whole thing. So again, the, the, the very fine dining French cuisine, you get a bite per plate. Uh, and then you get this, it, it, it's probably a bite per plate because of the preparation and how rich everything is. Uh, it, you, can, you can be full on flavor alone as far as a perfect palate goes. Most of the time, not a whole lot of people have a perfect palate. I know of maybe three people. But these people will come into this restaurant and they'll pay all this money for this super big experience. And by super big, I mean small bites. And it's because the cook is passionate about all of the flavors they're putting together. There is a sushi place in New York and the guy only serves 11 people a night. Eleven hundred dollars a person, but you get an experience. Mm -hmm. Whereas hibachi, again, it's an experience, but it's also kind of tacky. I don't know if you've ever been to one, but it, I recommend it. Um, but it's it's definitely a an experience you get full off of. And then you kind of have like your downtime afterward where you're just like, there was a lot going on. I mean, he's flipping the spatulas, he's cracking an egg, there's fire coming out of the onions, whole nine yards of it. And it's, it's great, but they can also kind of make fun of you. So it, they, they get to have their fun, you get to have your fun. They kind of just pick a chair and go like, I'm going to pick on that person. Yeah. Because they genuinely don't want to be here I go I say like go in and have an open heart because yeah they can see it yeah they can see the yeah the, I, they, I, I like the term butt monkey <laughs> yeah by any means you know you, you have these guys that sat there and it's like let's go to the hibachi place and then all of a sudden like the wife just goes I don't want to do that that's just too much like too much going on in front of me it's like just have fun yeah it's supposed to be fun mm -hmm. you pay a lot of money for it but you get full too and you get a, you get dinner and a show, uh, but art versus passion versus what the customer wants. What the customer wants. I mean, you know, the art is I'm going to fill you up on flavor. Uh, passion is I want people to feel warm. It's kind of what I had. I didn't have a whole lot of the art side because. My background with my family was just get full, like the food. Um, so then, let's see, art, passion, and then fill. You know, 
customer needs. The customer is not always right. I'm going to tell you that right now. <laughs> yeah. um, I'll, I'll go back to the country club. Uh, I had an event that I was doing. It was a big golf event. And I didn't know who she was. Nor did I care. <laughs> it's just who I am. Um, and this woman comes up to me. And I have a, a pork coin and sitting in front of me. and It's all cooked to the same temp. It's nice and juicy. It's nice and crispy on the outside, nice and soft on the inside, and I'm, I'm cutting off pretty thick pieces uh, as far as it goes, and you know, everyone's getting like four pieces. She goes, I'd like a rare piece. I'm like, it's all cooked the same. She goes, I want a rare piece. I was like, one, you don't eat rare pork. That's kind of my thought process in my head. I was like, I'm sorry, I can't give you a rare piece. Everything is cooked the same. She goes, no, you don't understand me. I want a rare piece of pork loin. I, okay. Now you're getting on my nerves. Yeah. And this kind of goes on to the, um, don't tick off the people that you're, that are cooking your food. And I'm like, I, I'm, I'm, I'm really sorry, ma'am. I can't do that. She goes, do you know who I am? And I was like, no, no. She goes, I want to speak to your manager. And I went, and at, at this point, I had already explained to her, I was like, well, listen, you can't eat raw pork, rare pork, in any shape or form. You're going to get sick. And I refuse to feed you raw meat. That would make you sick. So I'm sorry, I can't do that. I want to speak to the manager. I was like, oh, oh, I guess. Okay. Well, I was the head chef. So I'm like, Okay, so I am a smart ass. A huge smart ass. And I walk back into the kitchen, I come out the outdoor, and I'm like, hi, my name is Kevin. I'm the head chef. She goes, I'm gonna go talk to my husband. She left. I didn't see her for the rest of the night. Fine, so what? I get a phone call that night. We're gonna have a board meeting tomorrow. Okay, fine. Get there at 6 a.m. See this woman whispering to her husband. I'm like, oh, that's your husband. <laughs> Again, I don't care. He's already had four divorces. He's a surgeon. You signed a prenup. Yeah. It doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> and she's pointing at me. And the only reason why we had the board meeting is because she just decided to gripe enough to her husband and go, we need to have a board meeting tomorrow because of this, because of that. I'm just thinking like 6 a.m., like how late are the country clubs open? And uh, in Bemidji, well, I was there until 1 in the morning because I was cleaning everything. Yeah, and then you got that turnaround. And then I got that turnaround, yeah. Hours are terrible as a cook. Yeah. Uh, that, that's, that's a whole different problem. Mm -hmm. Um... So, I'm like, okay, and I approach this, I feel like I'm in court, <laughs> I approach the stand, <laughs> and I'm just like, and just like, so what do you need? It's like, I need more money, because uh, we're, we're running out of food. Yeah. As were most of my conversations with them. Hey, we're running out of money, because we need more food. Okay, we'll give you more. Everyone's and, getting toast. Yeah, right. <laughs> and then uh, he's no toast. Yeah. So then he stands up, and I'm just like, okay, what do you want to say? I understand that you wouldn't serve my wife rare pork. And I went, that's because I didn't want your wife to get sick. Do you know what happens when you eat raw pork? And he goes, well, I'm a doctor, so yeah. I went you understand why that's dumb. He goes, fair enough. He sits down, <laughs> whispers over, and I just... Uh, I didn't cause it. I feel like it was her own kind of, like, ignorance mm -hmm. of thinking, like, I can get whatever I want. 
and so he got another divorce. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, well, yeah, that's obviously you know, that, that's that's her own ignorance. Like, yeah. I can get whatever I want, mm -hmm. and it's just like, he's a doctor, and she said rare piece of meat, not specific what type of meat it was. If it was beef, by any means, you want rare, I'll go back and make it. Mm -hmm. That's fine with me. Pork, I'm not serving that to you. I'm sorry. So, you know, it. I, I think I feel like I went on a tangent about that. Um, yeah. Well, we can. We were kind of getting to like. Uh, let's talk about like menu design. Yeah, menu design. That's. Because there's like there's placement and then there's traps and then there's. Like, yeah. Um, we'll, we'll start with traps. Um, the reason why they don't take the menu away from you. They want you to continue to order drinks because they want you to continue to they, they want you to finish your meal and go I want dessert. If a waitress is smart or a waiter is smart, they won't take that away from you. They won't take the drink menu away from you because they want to make more money. Yeah, well, drinks are a huge problem. Oh yeah, they are. I mean, you're getting a shot of vodka and you know the rest of it's all sugar. Nice. Yeah. So, as as far as that goes, I mean that that's that's your biggest trap is drinks. Um, placement. I mean, menu placement is. What what do you? As far as like the well, sign of the menu or? Oh, well, like I remember learning about. I I took a graphic design class and mm -hmm. they talked about like different areas of the menu where the eye goes and whatever. But we can to be more interesting to people than just me. Yeah. <laughs> um, let's talk about, like, uh, let's, let's go to this one. Like, having a, a, a variety versus, like, a few actually good options. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I work both at Applebee's and at the Country Club at the same time because I wasn't making enough money. Um, Applebee's menu, everything's all over the place. Um, I did not design it, and because it's a corporate thing. Um, your eye is drawn to before calorie counters. Uh, your eye is drawn to things you're familiar with, and they start with the most expensive thing at the top, just because. It's the first thing you see. So the most expensive salad is at the top. The most ex expensive steak dinner is at the top of those specific sections because that's where people look. That's where people look. Yeah. Burgers, most expensive one on the top. Or the special, which is like the new thing that came out, which is probably the most expensive one, which has a picture. <laughs> uh, my design was I wanted everything to flow very, very well. Uh, I, I didn't have prices on my stuff because everything was basically the same thing. Salads are $11, burgers are $9. Steak dinners is gonna be those parts, I had a number by it versus like, oh, eleven ninety nine. Just I, I had a simple like 11 or yeah. like 12 or 9 or... So, like, I don't want to use the word minimalist, but like, le less busy. Yeah, because, I mean, even with tax, it's going to cost more. So, like, I can, I can put a straight number on there, mm -hmm. and it was, it was that. But I didn't have a dessert menu. I didn't have an appetizer menu. It was just front and back. And that was it. Because I was very simplistic. And yeah, minimalist was actually what I was going for. Because you're paying per sheet of paper. And if you get it laminated, cool. Then you can cross off things that were out of for the time being. That was smart. Yeah. I planned ahead of time. It's like, oh, I got a golf event coming up. I need more walleye. Yeah. But th those those specific things, like, uh, and, and my thing was, it's like, I taught all of my wait staff at that point was, you know, what's the one thing that's going to put money in your pocket because you're running off tips. And they're just like, well, I don't know. It's just like, keep the menu at the table. The order an appetizer. Go back, check on them. If they want a burger, if they want dinner, if they want this, if they want that, run them by the specials every Friday, 
is prime rib. Every Wednesday is walleye. Just run with it. We'll figure out the rest of the days. Oh, okay. But don't take the menu away from them. Because they're going to want to continue to order things. And I've, I've always been, you know, feed the customer, make them happy if they have a complaint. We had a little uh, technical issue with um, running out of camera power, so I'm going to see if we can piece this together. Uh, we're still with Kevin, so we were talking about cooking. So let's jump to what are your thoughts about like going out to eat versus like just learning to cook? Um, with the pandemic, learning to cook has actually got a little bit easier because there are some restaurants out in the United States, Europe, other places, they sell a whole kit that you can make their, the, the restaurant's food, their quality food at home mm -hmm. with everyday appliances you would find in your kitchen versus industrial kitchen. The differences between those two things is just they get it for wholesale, you buy it at the store. Uh, and then you can take and they have recipe cards on them, directions, how to do it, making your own food. They give you all of the ingredients of everything. And then you can take that recipe card and then bring it to the grocery store and buy all these things and make it again. It's just you get to actually see how expensive it actually is for the restaurant to buy these things. It's not that expensive. So, but beforehand, learning to cook at home versus going out to eat. I've always been a firm believer of, if you don't know how to make it, learn. Go out, try it. And then learn, and then learn if how you to like it. Like let's learn how to make it yourself. Yeah. But learn how to make it easier. Don't do the 12 hour long brine because yeah. you can do it in a vacuum pack for yeah. an hour. Well, and that's, there's a difference between, and you can touch on this, like learning to cook something fancy to impress a date or just I need to feed my family. Exactly. And um, I've done both. Um, learning to cook for a fancy date. Some people impressed by pancakes. Some people are impressed by steak. Learn the techniques and then implement it for that specific part. If you learn the technique, if you need to go out and buy a cast iron pan for a steak, go to a thrift shop, go to a thrift shop, scrub the sucker down with soap. <laughs> will tell you not to put soap on a cast iron pan all the time. Scrub it down with soap, season it properly, just look up how to do it. The internet is innovative now. Just... And it's on a computer. It's on a computer. <laughs> like, you, you don't have to sit there and go like, well, but it, there's 70 years of seasoning on there. That's disgusting. Yeah. You don't know where that came from. Whereas it's like if it's handed down by the family, it's just like, it's still, you need to wash it. Like, you put a little bit of soap in it's okay. Yeah. Learn how to take care of it. Reseason it. Do what you need to do. Learn the technique on how to cook a steak on a grill, on a well, charcoal grill, gas grill, or even in the cast iron pan. And impress what you need to impress. Whereas, like, you need to feed a family. Throw it in the oven. Throw it in a crock pot. Throw it in the instant pot. Yeah. Do what you need to do. It doesn't mean that it has to taste bad. It really doesn't. <laughs> Food is simple. Spices are simple. Spices are inexpensive. You'll sit. You'll think like, oh, well, there's this jar of garlic salt, garlic powder. It's three dollars. How much of that you really need for one meal for three people? Not a lot. That three dollars lasts you two months or two years, <laughs> two years, depending on how many people you're feeding. But uh, coming from a large, not sibling, but like uncles, cousins, grandparents, parents, family, 
you don't need fancy things to make it good. And I think that's something that people have to kind of grasp onto because if they keep on thinking like, I need to go out and eat, you're going to spend more money. Whereas like, you go and buy it at the grocery store. And it's fine. Like, you can make the same exact thing. It's, n it's not going to taste as good because there's not as many preservatives in it. The U.S. is terrible about that. You go to Canada and their KFCs have less ingredients in it for some reason, or their McDonald's or anything like that. Their cereals have less ingredients. In it. I don't know. Why. Well, that's a completely different like thing that I could get on about, but I won't. Yeah. Uh, preservatives are are I think ruining things, but uh, that's my own opinion. Um, so, yeah, as far as that goes, just learn the techniques, learn how to do it, look up on the internet. Do what you need to do, and slow down. Life is one day at a time. And I think that's what people are thinking, like, too far ahead. Take it one day, learn the new skill, look up the new skill, and take your time and enjoy it. Yeah. Because one, one thing that I, I've found with, uh, and it was a learning curve with my wife uh, transitioning from like my own family and culture versus like mm -hmm. you know like uh, you know, Noah built the ark before it started raining yep. start cooking before you're hungry yeah <laughs> definitely uh, because if you don't you teach a man to fish yep. he'll never starve yeah but do you get um, I mean, you're, it's just you and your wife right now. Yeah. So, but so, do you get annoyed having to cook at home after cooking all day? I used to. Uh, I don't do it anymore, and I enjoy it now. And I think I will continue to enjoy it as long as I probably don't go back into that field. Sure. Um, my hands hurt. <laughs> my fingertips don't feel anything, but it's fine. Um, it's, it's just been a long, long journey to get to where I'm at, and uh, I lost cooking for a little bit, but I'm regaining it, and I'm continually enjoying it more and more each time I do it. I still eat out a lot, but that's par for the course. <laughs> so. So we'll wrap it up with this one. Like, what does it mean for somebody to like be good at cooking? Slowing down, reading the directions, and taking your time with it. And instead of shoveling food in your mouth, enjoying the process that it takes to actually cook something. That, in my mind, is being good at cooking because you're enjoying it and you're having this interaction both with, you know, your family, the food, and what you did to get it there. You don't have to go to culinary school to be a good cook. It just takes practice. You don't need to work in a restaurant to be a good cook. You can do it in your home. You just have to have the practice, the knowledge, and the resources. And I think that's something that people can kind of grasp onto and actually think about while they're just sitting at home contemplating, what am I going to do for dinner? Instead of thinking about that, look up online. Weird things to eat for dinner at home with XYZ ingredient. You'll get something and it, it will probably be weird. And guess what? You might like it. You might not. Yeah. I, uh, I love burgers and I love peanut butter. Do not put them together. There was a restaurant where they had that. And oh, yeah? I was curious and I regretted it. You don't it. like the Elvis burgers? Is that oh. what they're called? Yep. Okay. Yeah, the, uh, Elvis, Elvis patented that one. He wanted peanut butter on a burger for some yeah. reason. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> like, it was, I'll, I'll say it was interesting. Mm -hmm. Like, I wouldn't call it bad outright, but it was just like... Oh, see, uh, my wife loves it. Oh, <laughs> some people like it, some people yeah. don't. 
yeah. it's dependent. Yeah, and the other thing I was gonna say is just I'm, I'm I know I'm guilty of the eating fast. Yeah. So I need to work on that. Yeah, I am too. Uh, the the food industry has definitely brought me into you know get it done in five minutes. Well, that, know, eat, then it's eat. also like even in school like recess like you, yeah. you get this much time for lunch and if you can shrink lunch down to this much and you get that much more recess. Yeah. You know, it's like, yeah, yeah, definitely for the kids. But, what about like uh, work situations? You get X amount of time, but you need oh, yeah. to drive and yep. so whatever. Yeah, it's, and it, honestly, it's sometimes not worth it. Yeah. It's so. Oh, and I wonder about like, uh, you know, like um, European countries or like uh, South America where they do like the siesta stuff and, yep. and the meals take like hours because you, mm-hmm. you take your time with your sand. Like, yeah. Learn about it. Learn about the cultures. And yeah. Make it at home. You don't have to dig a hole to make something. You really don't. We have ovens for a reason. Because <laughs> there are places that oh, we'll dig an eight-foot hole around and like put a whole pot in it, and then like have a fire underneath it and then bury it. You don't need to do it. We have an oven for a reason. They do it that way because that's the way that the culture wants it done, and it's a huge celebration you don't need to make it a celebration just make it quaint make it private put it in the oven don't do a whole in there <laughs> yeah call a utility yeah. Yeah. yeah so I think that's a good place to wrap it up so yeah. just thanks for being on the show not a problem probably do another one about just health and fitness and tying that in with cooking but yeah another day yeah